Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Welcome to the Michelle Miao Show at the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm John Zipper, the club's vice president of media and editorial. Now, we hope you're staying safe and are well wherever you are. We are eager to return to in-person programming, so keep an eye out for our reopening news. We look forward to seeing you in person once again when it is safe at the Commonwealth Club's headquarters in downtown San Francisco. Until that happens, we are doing all of our programming online. This is the latest in more than 450 programs the club has produced online since the beginning of the pandemic. You can find all of our upcoming programs, as well as podcasts and video from our past events at commonwealthclub.org. Now, if you're watching us live on YouTube, use the chat box to submit questions for our special panel today. And now, let me introduce Michelle Miao. She's the producer and host of The Michelle Miao Show and a member of the Commonwealth Club's Board of Governors. Good to see you again, Michelle. Thank you so much, John, and thank you to you all for joining us for our special program this evening inside the Adachi Project. We'll be speaking to founding members and community advocates, as well as play a short film, 111 Taylor. The film highlights the negligence of a halfway house, 111 Taylor, during COVID-19. I'm honored to introduce to you our first panel of speakers. Mano Raju is San Francisco's public defender whose office founded the Adachi Project in partnership with Compound and Even Odd. And also Santosh Daniel, who's the founding partner of the Adachi Project, is also a writer, producer, and creative communications strategist specializing in arts, media, and impact initiatives. He is founder of the creative strategies group Compound and also co-founder of First Kitchen Media. Welcome both. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Mano, so why did your office decide to co-create the Adachi Project? Well, let me start by, you know, the name of the project is the Adachi Project. And I want to lift up uh, Jeff Adachi, my predecessor in this position, um, in addition to his belief that we should be aggressive advocates in the courtroom, leave no stone unturned and provide the best possible defense for our clients. He saw it as, his, as one of his missions to try to broaden the public understanding of public defenders and the work that we do. One of the reasons I came to this office for Contra Costa County was that I was inspired by the movie Presumed Guilty that I watched, which is a film uh, produced by, by Jeff. And in that, you just get a whole different understanding of the flavor of what we do, the adrenaline rush of having a large caseload and fighting hard for those clients, and at the same time, humanizing people humanizing people who are so often dehumanized in the system. And the idea behind the Adachi project is to collaborate with skilled artists so we could do more of that on a consistent basis. Thank you so much. It's very exciting, the Adachi project. I mean, when I caught wind of the news, I thought it was just such a wonderful way to honor the work of Jeff Adachi. Santosh, you knew Jeff Adachi from when you were both on the board of California Humanities. What was it about Jeff that inspired you to approach the public defender's office after Jeff died to start this legacy project? Sure, so thank you again for having us here. And, um, you know, I'll just start off by saying I knew Jeff for about um, <clears throat> 15 years before his passing. And at the time when we met, you know, I had been following his work at the public defender's office for quite a while. And there was something about him, obviously he's a very enigmatic figure. And there was something about the power of which he was able to tell a story that was very attractive. And that's how we ended up sitting on the board together. And, you know, as he and I spent time together talking about California humanities and stories about California, sort of really how to tell the narrative of our cities and our counties and what we're doing, uh, Jeff started talking about how he wanted to do this series about public defenders. And, you know, over the course of a couple of years, just having that conversation with him and hearing him talk about the work of public defenders and really how it's just not, it's not so much just about the public defense work, but it really is about bringing forward the full truth, the complete truth and letting people really be aware that there's not just one side to a story, there's not just one truth, but there is a complete truth that needs to be told. That was really the inspiring factor that when Jeff passed in order to commemorate not just his legacy as a public defender 
and also his work as a filmmaker, but sort of carry forth what he was doing and rather than just making an army of one, make it an army of many. Uh, that's what uh, inspired me to come to the public defender's office and say, hey, I think we should try to continue what Jeff was doing, but then expand on it and create a much larger initiative that could bring in the community. And they could really draw people in who are inspired to do the same thing, inspired to seek that same kind of truth and that same kind of inquiry, bring us all together and let's do something larger than what, based on what he did, but larger than what he imagined. So that's, that's where we started. That's so great. Mano, the film we're about to see today um, is called 111 Taylor during a pandemic, which I mentioned earlier, and it features one of your office's clients who was living in this halfway house when the pandemic hit. Why did you feel it was important to make this film? You know, there's this uh, phrase that, you know, uh, a picture tells a thousand words, uh, but and think of how much more we can do with film, right? It can tell so many more words. And, you know, we're in this moment right now where there were, there was an international um, protest with millions of people on the streets this summer because they saw tragically what happened to George Floyd on camera. And his words, screaming mama, um, you know, captured the heart of the world in terms of all the inequity and pain and tragedy that composes our current criminal legal system. But the reality is there's a lot of that pain and tragedy in jails, in prisons, with electronic monitors, on probation, on parole, all over this country. We live in the incarceration and decarceration capital of the planet. And the stories just aren't getting out there in the way that they do. And I think there's a general awareness of structural racism and structural inequities in the system. But the vision of this is to tell the stories of the particular structures. And this is one structure, and you're gonna hear uh, from one of our clients, telling that a deeper story about the structure of people coming out of prison still feeling that they're in prison. And in this case, and I don't wanna to give too much of a spoiler, but you'll see that you know the decisions where people have to be kept there are so irrational because it's actually leading to potentially more people becoming ill. We're in a pandemic. And you know, there's this notion that you judge a society by how it treats its most vulnerable. And I think that's morally true. And in this film, we see how it's also scientifically true because it, we're actually risking people in our community becoming ill because of the dehumanization of the individuals and the insistence that they stay in a place where they don't really need to be. Um, and you'll see some of the intimacy of the film though comes because our client is speaking to his attorney. And that's something that's really important to bring home. There's so many times in our system there where we look at the prosecution or the police point of view, but their perception is limited by a police report, which is something fixed in time, told by people who often have implicit bias, if not explicit racism. And, um, and, it, and it's over the time and the police report's done with the with an overt goal of justifying particular charges and justifying an arrest. All the other work, all the fuller humanity, all the bigger picture of what happened is something that can only be brought up by the defense team through our investigation, through our motion work, through the story of the client, through a deeper understanding, through a deeper understanding of the picture of what happened. Those kind of stories can only come about if we lift up and elevate and amplify the voices of the accused. And I think that's what's done very powerfully by our skilled filmmakers. Absolutely, I'm so with you. And I think that you know, having the stories of human beings told in this way and from this, from this vision and actually having folks like you involved in films like this is what we need for our community. So Santos, as a co-creator of this film and someone who works in the arts, why is the Adachi Project and a film like we're about to see so important for audiences during this very moment at this very time? No, it's, a, it's a great question. You know, and I should just start off by saying one of the, one of the sort of founding principles of the Adachi Project and, and what we're hoping to do collectively, individually, and as a community is that, um, I don't wanna say demystify, but in some ways deconstruct what people mean when they talk about the system. I think for people like Mano and people in his office, the attorneys, the other people that work there, the understanding of the system is clear on many fronts because of their working in it. 
But I think that outside of that system, the general public, the community at large, those of us who are activists, those of us who are working hard for justice, when we talk about the system, I think the system for many people is a very large and amorphous thing. And there's a very, it's a very, it's not an easy thing to be able to find what that means down in its most granular micro realities. And one of the things that's important about the Adachi project is one of the things that we try to do is that we try to not just look at the system and talk about it in its largest, most comprehensive way, but really sort of break it down to its micro realities, the little things that come together to create minor injustices or other injustices to then collaborate to create this large injustice of a system. And so when you look at a film like 111 Taylor, the reason that something like this becomes important is that, and again, like Leno said, not giving away too much, but one of the things about a film like this is that <clears throat> it is really focusing, it's important. It's in focusing on that moment when people are leaving prison and re-entering the world. And something that people don't often realize is that however small that moment is or may seem to them from the outside, for that person that's going through it, it's a very critical moment and it can sometimes make or break their, you know, what they end up doing in life afterwards. But it's one of those micro realities of the system that people don't realize that when you create a situation like what we see in the film, becomes a minor injustice or a smaller injustice and then comes together with all different other parts of the system to create this very large unjust system. So that's one of the reasons why that a film like this is important because it really does break down what people know about the system at large into smaller pieces, I don't wanna say digestible, but things that they can understand on a more visceral personal level. Mano Santos, thank you so much for all that you do and thanks for bringing us the Adachi Project. It's been a joy speaking with you both. Thank you so much, Michelle. Thank you. And so now it's time for us to take a look at that film, uh, 111 Taylor, and it's a film in which we've been talking about. It's about a halfway house and it features uh, a parolee who was living at this halfway house. And he highlights how the facility had pretty much failed or had become negligent during COVID-19. So let's watch the film, 111 Taylor. My parole agent thought it was a good idea to put me in 111 Taylor Street. It's transitional housing in the Tenderloin District. And he told me, just consider it your apartment. You have more freedom where you can walk around and go in and out whenever you want. Kind of. There's set count times. This is what time chow is. And you get in and out of the building through passes. I guess these people are banking on the fact that if you're not used to freedom, they don't have to really give it to you. I'm going to make one last pass downstairs to the Fed floor and the dining room and see if I could document what it looks like inside of this place. Okay. You could get a two-man room. There was even a 14-man room with three bathrooms. I mean, it was a six-man room with one bathroom. I remember having a meeting when this first started happening. Someone said, are we getting masks? And the assistant CEO, he said, oh, you don't need masks unless you already have coronavirus. The beginning of all this, now we weren't allowed to wear a mask. And that's one of the conditions of my parole, is I can't wear a mask. As soon as there was a hint of the virus, the parole agents stopped coming to 111 Taylor We've been doing any dealings with the parole officers over the telephone, and that's been minimal.
Okay, right now I'm in my room and I'm filming a gentleman that's been here for a year. And now that his time is up, it's time for him to go during the pandemic. And 111 Taylor didn't really set up anything for you, did that? Nope. And they don't care where you go? No. And we're in the middle of shelter in place, but you have to be out of here by today because they need the bed. Yes. I was lucky to get some place because they weren't even letting us out to find some place to live or to talk to some transportation about moving and stuff. They're not even letting us out for that kind of pass to look for uh, a job or a place to live. So this is the day room, obviously. No social distancing. There might be 10 of us in this room. I'm close enough to touch the person next to me and I'm all the way in the corner. They were having us clean certain surfaces every night and then now we're wearing masks, but you know, there's not a lot of hand washing. Saturday, I arrived and I couldn't help but notice it was an EMT out front. They were putting someone in the ambulance, but they were wearing these really weird blue aprons. No one officially told me, but they took someone out of there that had tested positive. Maybe two more days went by and I noticed there was another gentleman who was no longer there. They don't tell you anything. You look around and you go, oh, who's missing? Mr. Poor is one of my, you know, we try to call these rooms, but we kind of feel like this cells. He's one of my cellmates out of the six people that live in this room. Quite recently, we discovered that somebody tested positive for the virus. And now that person is actually back in the building. Back in the building. Hold on one second. We have one confirmed positive case. And believe you when I tell you this, there's no such thing as just one confirmed case. There's more, they just ain't confirmed them yet. How many, we don't know. But let's put him back in the building with the other people because, well, I ain't figured that one out yet either. I guess, you know, Something happens to one of us, it's no big loss to society. But I came here thinking I had a safe haven. It was nice, I'm out of prison. Oh my God, it, it couldn't be that bad. Well, that was wrong. Yesterday we were supposedly going to all be tested because there's a confirmed case, at least one. There's no movement outside of the building. We're all waiting. So I'm going to take a little stroll down the hallway. We're all waiting. Waiting and waiting. Uh, nobody running the ship in the office. Uh, we had the Department of Health come yesterday and just do a walkthrough. Just wait. Yeah, that's right. And so now we're all crammed into smaller spaces because they just kicked everybody out of the day room when there were too many people in here to begin with. Yeah, they, they, they Pick it all out, wipe it down. Yeah, wipe it down. Someone <laughs> asked me, is that the residence? sterilizing with no gloves and spray bottles and paper towels? Mm -hmm. I said, yeah. They said, that's not how that goes. No. Protocol, the health department comes in, sterilizes the room, sets up, and then they know they're in a sterile environment. Well, just think of the, the, what you're saying makes so much sense because if we have COVID, then we're the ones wiping the COVID on the COVID. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, if you can't <laughs> laugh, you gotta cry. Because this is funny, I'm telling you. 
Turk and Taylor outside. I kind of, kind of do this on the stealth before the next count time. On Wednesday, we were all tested at about 2, 2.30 in the afternoon. Took our cell phone numbers and told us that there would uh, be a phone call with all of our results. Thursday, I noticed that um, the staff was buzzing around like crazy, and it didn't take a genius to see them in their white uh, paper jumpsuits. And we realized that some of the results had come back and people were one by one testing positive. There was one guy, then there were four people. And before the night was over, there wound up being seven people. As you can see, quarantine there. Four people quarantined here. The big problem is the seven people that tested positive, they put them in that 14-man room with seven other people that were not positive. And when I got up in the morning and came out and looked at all the posters saying which rooms had been quarantined, it was 12 people. At that point, it's obviously spreading. 12 out of 80 people is only going to get worse. So on that um, on Friday, which was yesterday, I left there. I didn't take all my stuff, but I just took what I could because I had to slip out unnoticed. And once I got outside, I called my parole agent and I explained to him that uh, People were getting sick and it was spreading and it was going to get worse. And I'm 64 years old, African American, high blood pressure, all things that I've read that are, are making me more susceptible to the virus. Yesterday, I was willing to risk being uh, having a parole violation, even though I, I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm trying to stay alive and stay uninfected. I was willing to risk that for my health. I'm gonna give a call and talk to some more people tomorrow and find out what the update is on uh, 111 Taylor. Okay, thanks. Wow, what a powerful 11 minutes, uh, 11 minutes of telling us how society has failed some of our community members during a pandemic. I'm very honored to introduce you to our second set of speakers, our panel here, who will discuss the film. We have Mohammed Gorgistani, who's a founding partner of the Adachi Project, an Iranian born filmmaker and creative director who grew up in the underbelly of Silicon Valley. Hadi Razak, who is a managing attorney at the San Francisco Public Defender's Office. He has worked as a public defender for 17 years and has conducted more than 45 jury trials. He's also a core member of the Adachi Project team. Carolyn G. John Goosen, who is the San Francisco Policy Director with the San Francisco Public Defender's Office and a leading member of the Adachi Project. And also William M. Palmer II, also known as Tariq, who is a criminal justice advocate and former resident of the 111 Taylor Reentry Center. He's a committee member for San Francisco Reentry Sentencing Commission, direct services, and co-leader of the Subcommittee on Legislation, Policy, and Practices. He's the Communications Fellow for Legal Services for Prisoners with Children and the CEO and co-founder of Life After Next. Thank you all so much for being with us this afternoon for this 
program. Hadi, we'll begin with you. This was your client uh, who was filming this. He's obviously not here to talk to us tonight and the film protects his anonymity. Uh, but what were you hearing from him that compelled you to turn this into a film? Uh, thanks, Michelle. Um, you know, before the pandemic, uh, I was part of the team in the public defender's office that formed the idea of what would become the Adachi Project. And um, we were in the process of story mining and sort of identifying uh, potential stories to tell when, when COVID started. And meanwhile, I was in regular contact with my client uh, who I'm very close to, he's on parole. Um, he was forced to live at 111 Taylor Street, uh, a halfway house in the Tenderloin. And in late March and in, uh, in, say mid-March and uh, from, from then through April, when the fear and anxiety and uncertainty about the virus is really at the it, its peak for all of us, um, that, that he was texting and calling me extremely frightened, extremely panicked about what was going on at 111 Taylor. Um, no social distancing, not being allowed to wear a mask for some period of time, which he touches on in the film. Uh, residents who were allowed to leave uh, and go to work were coming back and living in the same rooms as residents who were not allowed to leave at all. Um, new uh, residents were arriving from state prison with unknown test results. Uh, the, the, the folks who were COVID positive were not being quarantined. Um, and I knew this client uh, really well. I actually just talked to him today and he's somebody who I, I knew would tell it like it is. Um, and so I started looking into 111 Taylor Street and the Geo Group. Um, which is a, you know, a multi-billion dollar private prison corporation that essentially started providing re-entry services to people exiting prison uh, across the country in halfway houses because they saw a business opportunity there. And um, you know, what I was seeing is that these private prison companies have a, a monetary incentive to fill beds and to keep people in them. And that leads to overcrowding. And that's particularly just dangerous and problematic during a pandemic um, in places like halfway houses, which like jails and prisons uh, are congregate living settings. Um, same thing happening with, with nursing homes where the virus is, is known to be easily transmitted. And so the more I learned from, from him, the more I wanted to get him out of there, which uh, we were able to do um, uh, through some advocacy to get him out of there and, and to be able to live uh, with a friend, uh, but then also to the extent possible, expose what was going on there. And that's what led to some late night conversations with Mohammed um, uh, at Even Odd about documenting what was happening there, getting our client a camera, filming the conditions to the extent he could do so safely and, um, and talking to the residents themselves who were forced to live in these really challenging circumstances. And from that, you know, really what we, we learned is that um, the, the, and I think what the film really tells powerfully is that uh, folks like my client were forced to make this impossible decision between staying at 111 Taylor and exposing themselves to the virus or leaving and risking violating parole and going back to prison. Thank you, Hadi. Mo, uh, as the filmmaker, you know, talk about some of the choices your team made when designing this film from um, such raw footage, what we see, we we're seeing there with some raw footage and why you found this so compelling. Um, every, every set of films or any film kind of has its own set of challenges, um, especially in the inception phase and the production phase. And this, for this one, it really starts with, um, just how to capture the footage in the first place. And um, Hadi's client who was at 111 Taylor, um, you know, we had to figure out a way that he was able to discreetly be able to document what was going on in there, but also to get enough footage that we could actually tell a story. Um, so that kind of led to creating almost a, um, a mini film school uh, where I was like recording videos at home, uh, putting together a little booklet about to do's and not to do's, almost like sending someone a drop kit um, in a remote place and hoping that they receive it and hoping that the instructions land with the with the equipment 
And then really um, the rest was in, um, in the client's hands and he gets a lot of credit for um, really being able to match the emotional state that him and everyone that was at 111 Taylor at that time was experiencing and then being able to have the just really that almost like a creative savviness to know what to film you can't really we, we gave him a list of stuff that we wanted to get documented but it's really some of these like imperfect moments that I think give the film the texture that makes it so visceral so then once we got all the footage it was really a matter of just building an assembly it was a very linear story um, in the sense that you know, we got the camera to him uh, at a moment where things were developing and, you know, everyone's worst fear came true um, while he was filming. And then we, he kept filming even when he had to make this really difficult decision of, and I think the tension in the film is imagining, not, and I think from, from a viewer's perspective, I really invite people to think about a situation where you have already had many odds stacked against you. You're in a place during a highly stressful time in, a, in, in the country. This is back at the beginning of the pandemic. So the uncertainty is out of control. You have no idea what this virus is gonna do or not gonna do. There's a narrative that the greater city of San Francisco is doing a great job, but here you are and you gotta make a decision to like save yourself or potentially break certain uh, uh, terms of your parole. It's a really impossible situation. And by the way, you're supposed to like deal with this in a very like calm manner and not have any outbursts. And, and th these are very unreasonable circumstances that compound on top of each other. So we just try to capture that feeling as much as possible um, that that informed kind of the sound design we did on the film. And we really embraced the kind of, you know, for me, it was a very humbling experience to go from shooting very like high production value, you know, uh, 20, 30, 40 people on set kind of productions and then going kind of back down to the, the core of what filmmaking is and, and what cinema is. And I consider this cinema, which is to convey this emotion um, that is hard to describe in just, in just words. So, um, so yeah, that, that's the gist of it. Thank you. And William, as a former resident of 111 Taylor, albeit not at the same time, what was your reaction to seeing this film for the first time. Brought back some uh, serious anxiety and emotions that um, I thought were long gone. You never know, you know, if you're truly over what you have experienced in a traumatic and uh, toxic filled environment until you are exposed to it again. Uh, those rooms look very familiar to mine. I was in a 12 man dorm, we had three bathrooms. Uh, as I explained to people who have interviewed me before, we had a bed bug problem uh, uh, when they exterminated with this uh, so-called non-pesticide uh, um, process, uh, I kept waking up with new bites. And so when I kept complaining, uh, the, the manager, the head manager, supervisor uh, uh, came in, Jason came in and started looking around and he, it, it was, he had, a, I had a sense that he knew what he was looking for. And he raised up my bed and saw this plywood underneath my mattress. And when he raised that up, it was the nest of all the bed bugs that were thousands and thousands of them. And they started crawling out again. And that all they did was bag it up and remove it. There was no apology. There was no compensation. There was nothing, but Hey, okay, now, now the problem is solved. So this is what I, uh, this was like one of the most worst things uh, of the house. But as you saw in the video, when he was filming down to the street, there are, for our practicality, bars on the window, a mesh screen to lock you in. This is confinement. This is not freedom. And I know houses, I know transitional houses that aren't like that. Uh, ones that, like uh, Tranquility House in Oakland, where it's like a seven man house, uh, one of them is a house manager. Uh, they give you $200 for food. You have a shared kitchen. And that's even if you have a job, they let you out to go to your job. They give you 72 hour passes on weekends so that you can just go. It's not like that in, 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 
in 111 Taylor. When I arrived at 111 Taylor, my family dropped me off. And remind you, I'm excited. I'm, I'm breathing this air. For, I'm just out of 31 years and 22 days of incarceration as a light uh, inmate, or I should I say prisoner. And when I'm walking up to it, I'm already getting a little worried. And I see the process of in and out. And it reminds me of like a work furlough prison program. And that's, that's prison. You have to come in and you can't leave on your own. And if I, I, I will tell everybody, I felt like I was still in a lower level prison at, at a time. And because of my excitement of freedom, it kind of tempered that for a minute. But as reality began to set in and my obligations of living on my own began to uh, be my responsibility, it felt like I was still in prison. Thank you so much for sharing that. and. Um... We don't want to expand on that a little later with Hadi, but uh, Carolyn, as the local policy director at the public defender's office, what kind of impact has this film already had and, and what, do, what end does it serve? Uh, first of all, I just want to say, Michelle, I'm a longtime fan of yours in this show, so I'm very honored to be here and thank you for having us. Um, you know, there's, this film has already been an incredible tool in helping bring visibility to so much of the harm that is coming out of the private prison industrial complex. And this is one piece of that that we don't hear a lot about. We don't, we hear maybe some more about ICE detention centers, which a geo group does run, private prisons, which they do run, but not this part of it. I, you know, three years ago, I would have thought, oh, you've done your time. You've gone to a parole board, you're let out. It's your time to be free and to kind of go back into society. And yet when our federal government and our state government contract with a private corporation like this, whose focus is their bottom line, we see that that is not what's happening. What is happening as William so beautifully described is not in the best interests of people who are trying to come back to their families and communities. At the local level, um, the film came out actually uh, soon after um, a local journalist, Malik Washington, who is the new editor of the Bayview National Black Newspaper, one of our most important black newspapers in the country. He was a resident at 111 Taylor um, when he became editor. And in January, uh, he became aware that there was a COVID outbreak in January. Now take it, our film was done some months before. So this, these issues had continued. He told a fellow journalist, Tim Redmond, former editor of The Guardian and now 48 Hills of what was happening. And Tim Redmond contacted um, Geo Group to ask about the situation. They denied that there was an outbreak and then they retaliated against Mr. Washington, took, taking away his cell phone um, and taking away credits. And you need credits to be able to be released quicker. And so they were trying to prevent his ability to leave. I'm speaking about his story now because he's currently not able to join us and, and speak about this. But um, as he spoke out, he and the Bayview newspaper uh, did file a lawsuit against Geo Group um, because of this treatment. And this film was able to help galvanize people, help people see what Malik was sharing had happened. And this was, here we go, right at the same time, a video illustrating exactly what Malik was talking about. And so we were very happy, um, all of us at the Public Defender's Office, Mino Raju, standing with Malik. There was a press conference that we all joined in a rally in front of 111 Taylor. And we're very grateful that this could be so useful to him and to the Bayview as there is this effort to really suppress um, the freedom of speech and the work of a very important uh, journalist and a resident who was then having to go and, and work every day with elderly um, editors um, of the Bayview and so didn't want to contract and spread the virus, right? So there's a very clear, obviously medical reasons. None of us want to contract COVID and spread it to the people that we love and, and care about. And so even just doing that basic service led to this issue. And so we've been very happy to see that. Another area is um, uh, Assembly Member David Chu, um, represents San Francisco, has a bill uh, that has been introduced, AB 328. Um, and it's the purpose of the bill is, you know, over time, over the past 20 years, serious crime has gone way down and therefore our prison populations have gone down. This has led to some talk of closing some prisons and just there's a lot of money that was going to CDCR, our state prison uh, system that 
this bill says that money should follow the people. So as the people leave, as these prisons decrease in numbers, that funding should follow them and provide housing. We know that one of the things that folks need is housing, is dignified housing. And so what we asked and we worked with um, uh, Assemblymember Chu's staff to make specific language in the bill that says the funding for that type of housing should go to nonprofits that are mission oriented. We need good, you know, dignified places for people to live and be successful and help them continue on the second chapter. And so we were able to use the film and show the film um, to his staff to say, listen, these are some of the things that are happening right now in our very, under our very eyes in our very city. Um, and so, you know, those are just a few examples where this is a, this company, you know, has, as I mentioned, uh, runs a lot of uh, immigration detention centers uh, and also now this reentry. So we've actually come together with advocates from both immigrant rights um, and, um, you know, prison um, issues, prison rights groups to come together to start talking about how can we address these issues. It's state and it's federal um, because both of those provide grants uh, and provide money to this corporation. And so it's, and, uh, it's just the beginning, but we're, we see that we're gonna continue to use this as a tool to provide more humane and dignified places for people to go. And so that re-entry, when we talk about it, we are helping people and providing, with, pro providing them with the services, the tools for them to be able to go and lead their lives. And as William described, th there are examples of that. And we should be using those examples and to make different policy decisions and budget decisions on where we spend those funds. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'm gonna come back to you, William, in just a, a second, but I wanted to touch on something that actually William, Mo, and Hadi both said, and there's a line in the film in which the person filming it um, who's impacted, he says, you know, I don't wanna violate, you know, my parole, but I kind of feel like I'm forced to, I have to in order to survive. This is one person saying this, but I think that this, I think that that's an encompassing statement for many parolees. Hadi, do you want to expand on, you know, the experiences of parolees and how at times they are pushed to the brink of violating their parole just to survive? Sure. I mean, I think that um, in the specific instance, it's, it's my client who's making that decision between staying and exposing some, himself to the virus or leaving and violating parole. Um, in a larger sense, I think it's really that um, when we have corporations that, um, putting it bluntly, put uh, profits over people, um, when, we, when our resources are devoted there, um, then rather than community-based reentry programs like Carolyn was touching on that are humane and dignified and help people find employment and um, housing treatment, whether it be mental health treatment or substance use treatment. Um, that's what keeps people out of the legal, the criminal legal system. And so, uh, you, you know, I think that the, the decisions that people have to make on a daily basis are, do I have to, um, you know, forego taking a job opportunity because I'm forced to do some sort of program that, I don't, that may not fit because the, the, the way that when a corporation is running reentry, they're not looking at individuals. And I don't think that there, um, there's genuine uh, individualized treatment. Um, it, it's more just, this is something that we're getting federal and state dollars to do, so we're gonna do it. And it's sort of a one size fits all, as opposed to looking at each individual as a unique individual, figuring out what they need and finding out what support system can best um, kind of help them moving forward. Thank you. And, and William, you had something to add. Yes, uh, because of my reaction to the film, I, I, I didn't get to say thank you for having me on the show. And uh, this is an honor to be here and to represent those guys who are in there and those guys who didn't have um, the, the ability to speak out for, uh, uh, speak out because of the, for, um, didn't have the ability to speak out uh, for the conditions of GEO and just went along. Uh, I am a rebel. I, I don't mind uh, sacrificing myself for the common, uh, for the greater cause. Uh, uh, Caroline said something that's so important and I touched on it. It doesn't have to be this way. 
geo is a sober living environment, just as Tranquility House is, where they allow this freedom. But geo doesn't give you that same freedom. Uh, all of us are known on LSBC, which I work for, they are creating a transitional house. And guess who they are asking to help create that house? Formerly incarcerated people who had to live in houses. GEO doesn't do that. There are no formerly incarcerated people or former residents of GEO who benefited if they did from that program, who sit and help make decisions on how that house is ran. And as uh, Hadi said, it is for profit, not for the people. And when you when you have that mix of for profit and not uh, for the greater good of simulating these people who have spent decades in an already traumatic environment, and you don't provide that type of healing and transition back into society, then what good are you? That is not a transition. That is a do the best you can and survive. And if you don't, we'll just lock you back up. So when you don't have these elements in place, and recidivism rate is at 70% when uh, people who violating parole is uh, because they are allowing parole agents in the house to just run amok, then you are adding to the problem. So even with us, uh, Life After Next, we are looking for a, a place on Bush and Van Nuys, a Van Ness, which has uh, like a SRO setup where we want to run a transitional house as well that is beneficial to the people that we are gonna be serving and to be transparent and be a part of the civic uh, activities of our, our great city of San Francisco. So thank you again for having me on here and that this is being exposed for what it is. And hopefully I sit on a lot of committees in San Francisco. And one of the things that I'm asking for the, re the reentry council to do is to have an agency uh, within the uh, city hall that is uh, for reentry programs that we are able to govern who is in our cities, who is running the, the, the services that we are, are allowing them to provide our new our, our returning residents. And therefore, we'll have a better opportunity to manage this situation a lot better. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for sharing you this perspective that I don't think gets out there enough. Um, this is a question for any of you who would like to answer, but just how powerful is Geo Group? In, in, especially in the city of San Francisco, we're talking about one facility, but exactly how powerful are they? How many facilities do they impact? How many parolees do they affect? Uh, and I, I know the number is huge when you throw in the immigrant community, but just how powerful is Geo Group in San Francisco? I wish I could tell you the number of formerly incarcerated that they pack, but it's hundreds because they have federal and state uh, residents, clients in their housing. But I want to tell you this quick story. A friend of mine, a good friend of mine named Morgan Simon, who was a champion of, of human rights, took on Geo by herself as an individual. And they sued her trying to take away her house, her, her savings, and her life. And at almost at the end of the trial, the judge asked a simple question because the, the case was about, does Geo in their ICE program separate families? And that's the statement that she made, Geo separates families. And the judge finally during the end of the trial said, wait a minute, do you separate families? Where are the children? Where are the parents? And they had to admit that they are not together. And this judgment fell on her side and, and was awarded to her and saved her from being ruined by this corporation. So this is the power that Geo uh, uh, not only has, but uses to destroy lives of people who try to question their practices from a simple statement. We don't have the, we don't have the freedom of speech. We don't have the freedom to question what's going on in our cities and what's going on with uh, those who are less powerful to stand up for themselves. So in that respect, Geo has a lot of power and, 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 and wells it well. Mm -hmm. I'll add a little bit to that. They, um, if you look at a combined state contracts, federal contracts, um, and the immigration detention centers, as well as uh, prisons and reentry centers, over 74,000 people across the country are in uh, a geo run facility, run bed. Um, just in 2019, they made $2.5 billion. They're a publicly traded company, they're an international company. Um, 
And, you know, the, the power is deep. When in, in the world of the immigration detention, um, some of the leaders of GEO are former top level ICE officials. So there's a reason why, uh, you know, people are getting these massive contracts and that this is a multi-billion dollar industry. And one last thing, they get special privileges to go inside the prison and speak to the, the prisoners and tell them how great GEO is. Not everybody gets to go in to, into the prison, go into the facilities and speak directly to the prisoners. So when you're making your parole plans, as I did, and I submitted them to the parole board, I was like, let me go to jail. I really want to go to jail in San Francisco. And boy, was that a mistake. I'd rather have gone to Oakland and went to Tranquility House and in future life after next. I'm going to bring um, John Zipper back in case he's got some questions from our audience. Um, so John, welcome back. Thank you, Michelle, and thank you to all of you for your, your work on this. Um, I think most people probably don't know that the public defender system in California, uh, at least in part, uh, resulted from studies by the Commonwealth Club of California back in the early decades of the previous century. But all political decisions, of course, take place in a certain time. So I've got a question I'd like each of you, if you would, to answer, and that is, with all that this country has gone through and is focused on in the past year with regards to racial injustices and reevaluating public safety, are you more optimistic or more pessimistic right now that the country will change the way it approaches these issues of public safety and incarceration and crime and punishment? Who wants to go first? I'll, I'll hop in. Oh. Um, <laughs> Go ahead, All right, Mark. go for it, man. No, go ahead, Mark. I'll go after you. <laughs> um, I think I think to do this kind of work, you you have to stay optimistic. That's it's it's actually not really an option. Um, so we're and I think and I think the truth of whether uh, it's it's the objective reality is to be optimistic or pessimistic is is kind of um, you know that's like a that's like something that is a realm that you don't really, you can't really spend much time thinking about because I think that gets in the way of doing the work. And I think this kind of work, there's always going to be resistance in so many areas uh, from people who are, you know, vehemently against everything that you believe versus, or in addition to something even worse than that, just a lot of apathy and indifference. Um, but at the same time, there's a lot of people that day to day and pub and this is why public defenders are I, I think they're superheroes because they're not you know they're not uh you know like the rest of the civilian population we we at the end of the day are informed through a different way of what issues we should be caring about and upset about or organizing around or the public defenders every single day what they're trying to do is actually prevent certain uh for future names to not make headlines. You know what I mean? Um, so for me, it's just really about focusing on all the, all the amazing people. And when you do this work for a while, you meet so many people around the country that are doing amazing things and just trying to focus on that. And, and as a result, I think, um, you know, you, you maintain an optimism and go forward. William. Yes, uh, not only am I optimistic, but I will say prophetically that we are not going back pre-pandemic uh, standards, pre-George Floyd. I have to remind myself to breathe, you know, uh, and I don't say that lightly because of what happened to George Floyd, but uh, taking on the system as we do as formerly incarcerated people, we have to remind ourselves that we are serving a purpose. My 31 years and 22 days was not for nothing. The loss of my youth, 23 of those 31 years, the court has already said was constitutional excessive punishment. You can't give me back my youth. You can't give me back not being married. You can't give me back not having children. You can't give me back not being in the photographs of my family's uh, weddings and funerals and graduations. So what, what was that for? It was to come out here and do the work. So many of us, I am not the abnormal. I am not the exception to the rule. I am the, the norm. And people like Airline Woods with Ear Hustles being a voice of what's going on inside. People like Yusuf Wiley with Timeless Organization, 
people like Adnan Khan putting in the work with restorative justice. So many of us have gotten out and either started our own nonprofit organization or work with organizations, being civically engaged, making sure that we have not only a seat at the table, but a voice that's being heard the correct way. Because we went into these institutions and we had to, in order to get out, we had to know why we became that person to go in what we had to do to correct ourselves and then make a life plan to make sure that we not only not create any more victims, but make sure that we change the system starting with ourselves. So we are the voice and we are the solution and we are sitting at the table and we are making sure that it gets done. And when I came out in 2019, I knew that the next decade was gonna be the age of the slave. Those who are formerly incarcerated, involuntary servants and uh, uh, former uh, uh, penal slaves, as Dorsey Nunn and Oliver Nunn and LSPC right now working on ACA3 to remove involuntary servitude out of the Constitution of, of California and the United States and other states. This is the movement. This isn't just an organization. This is the movement that's happening. And for those who aren't getting on board, you will be left behind in your old ways. But the rest of us, there's a new day and a new, and a, and a new life and it's happening now. Thank you. Carolyn, what are your thoughts? Well, I could not agree with you more, William. I mean, listening to you right now has me optimistic, inspired, and you know that's what fuels me. I get to work with incredible people like William, all of us are none, um, Young Women's Freedom Center. There are incredible leaders in San Francisco, particularly leaders who have been impacted by this system, who are helping and, and working with, with public defenders, with filmmakers, with policy wonks like myself, and we are working together to make real tangible changes, to shift resources to communities who need it the most. There, I, I feel incredibly optimistic and, and very lucky to be able to work in a city like San Francisco, where even though there are so many problems and inequities, we also are a place where um, real change is possible because creative new ideas are able to be tried out here. And so I um, am constantly, you know, we're going to be the first city in the country that closes our juvenile hall by the end of December, 2021. We are going to be, you know, starting universal basic income. We have a group here now. We are transforming our mental health system um, with Mental Health SF. And these are not perfect solutions. None of them are silver bullet solutions. But I believe that we can make change together, especially when we have the diversity of leadership, um, the passion, the will, the rage, and the love that I feel this community puts into the work. Um, when we have folks like Michelle Mao and yourself who are willing to highlight the voices and the work of folks who are talking about issues that are often not spoken about. And Hadi. You know, I, I uh, have been a public defender for, for 17 years and I feel as sort of fired up, but also optimistic as I, as I was, when I was when I was brand new. I mean, I think this is an important moment where we are, um, we have to confront uh, our, the history of racial injustice in this country. And it's, it's intimately tied to what's happening in the criminal legal system. And I think that, uh, you know, we have to lift up the voices and include the voices of Tarek and other people who are, um, who've, who who've, have lived experience in the system. And I think that, you, you know, and we have to engage a broader audience, frankly, and that's sort of circling back to the purpose of the Adachi Project is really taking the storytelling that we do as public defenders um, and as trial attorneys and uh, reaching a broader audience with the aim of counter countering stereotypes about our clients and their communities and sort of revealing parts of the system that, um, th th that the public typically doesn't see. Um, and this is maybe a question for you, uh, Hadi or Carolyn. Um, I know the uh, Adachi Project is the first of its kind in the nation. Have you heard of any other public defender offices across the country that are either looking to replicate it or who have talked to you about it? You know, I, I, I haven't, we haven't yet, you know, but one thing I, I notice um, from, uh, you know, being involved as a, uh, in, in, with different public defender's offices is uh, other public defender's offices often look to San Francisco for, for leadership. And it's something that I think um, we take very seriously because we know that things that we do, like for example, the Adachi Project and uh, you know, this sort of um, creative way of engaging a broader audience, like I was just talking about, 
that this is something that can be replicated and um, is an important way of uh, people getting closer to the issues that are important to public defenders and the work of public defenders as well. Good, and then maybe just quickly for everyone before I hand this back to Michelle, where can people go to learn more about the Adachi Project, see more of these stories to maybe get involved and, and learn more? So the, the website is we uh, the, where the films are. There are two films available, three films available now. There's going to be one coming soon. The website is wearedefender.com. And uh, the, the, there's also the adachiproject.com. Um, and Defender is the first series of work of the Adachi Project. So wearedefender.com is where uh, viewers will find uh, the films as well as um, some written uh, uh, editorials that give some more information and context to the films. Very good. Thank you. Back to you, Michelle. I want to thank you all for joining us this evening. This has been incredible. And um, I'll add to, to Hadi, uh, you can come back also to the Commonwealth Club because we hope that this will, we'll be able to do the second film, the third film and have more discussions about how we care for one another, how we care for all of our community members. I want to thank everyone on this panel for being with us this evening. Hadi, Carolyn, Mo, and uh, William, thank you for the work that you do. Santosh and Mano, thank you also for the work that you do and for defending all of us, no matter what. Um, and we'll keep forging on and we'll take a look at Adachi Project or the Adachi Project. And also thank you to the Commonwealth Club for being the platform for all of us to come together. John, back to you. <laughs> We're doing ping pong here between uh back and forth. But thank you everyone again. And thank you all of you for watching and listening. Please share this video and the podcast with your friends and other people you think might be interested. And of course, find more Commonwealth Club programs and Michelle Miao show programs at commonwealthclub.org slash MMS. Have a good weekend. Stay safe and be well. <laughs>